switch, a speed bump along the unfolding story of God's relentless love for all the nations of the world. The brutal execution and unceremonious burial of Jesus was just the last futile attempt of the death-dealing ways of the world to stop the gospel. And the good news is, hallelujah, it failed. God's promised new life won out over death. That's the awesome message of Easter. And we say, hallelujah, Jesus' way was vindicated. He was raised. It wasn't over. At the empty tomb, the disciples can say, as we sang as a choir, Grave, where is your victory? And, O oh, death, ha, where is your sting? For the end is not the end when God is involved in the process. The death of Jesus becomes not the defeat of, but the source of greater strength for the new resurrected gospel of Christ. Matthew wants the broken and bereft Jewish people to see that in Jesus, that potential of resurrection is for their own faithfulness to God as well. They can follow the Jesus way and they can be resurrected. They can reintegrate as a community into the world of nations through the power that Jesus has given them, if they believe it. The early church did not see itself as the victim of religious cruelty and Roman crucifixion. Even though Matthew makes it very clear, they were the responsible ones, they're the ones you would blame, but they do not see themselves as victims, but rather as victors over all the powers and the principalities that had been arrayed against them, all those secret backroom deals, all that stuff that the kings were trying to do and the rulers were trying to do and the religious priests were trying to do and the Pharisees were trying to do against all that, they won. Their way prevailed. Rome can do no ultimate harm to a faith that survives the grave. These Jewish believers who continued to follow Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, they started the church and we have to say praise God for them. It's this gospel of resurrected possibility instead of buried resentment. This commitment to the new creation, doing things Jesus' way instead of yearning for the recreation of the old ways that Matthew offers to those crushed and defeated Jews who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And he offers it to us as well. See, according to Rabbi Jesus, there's no need for a temple to mediate God's presence. You don't need to have God boxed up in some specific setting and served by some specially set-aside priest. You don't need that. There's no longer a need for sacrifices beyond the blood of Christ, which was already poured out, that's all behind us. That's over. We don't need to look for a God box on the hill. According to the Jesus gospel, there's no need to be resentful toward the Romans or committed to revenge for the deaths of the martyred zealots because Jesus already prayed for them and prayed for their pardon. Even those Romans who were crucifying him, he forgave them. He gave his life on their behalf too. See, to follow Jesus is to see things the way he did. And that would be full of grace and full of truth and full of love. Forgiveness, hope for the future, that's the antidote to the resentment and the revenge and the retaliation. You see, God's new creation, this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven on earth, includes all parties to the conflict. And they join in a mutual covenant of repentance and forgiveness. And they have special empathy toward those who are hurting to those who suffer. What Jesus and his followers modeled in their day was a ministry of reconciliation instead of recrimination. It was the promise of resurrection instead of retaliation. Love your enemies, Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, and pray for those who persecute you. Now, to do so would be an example of this new way of understanding history not with an eye toward recriminations and desire for retaliation, but toward reconciliation as a new foundation for peace, hope for the future, a new reconciliation. Matthew wrote his gospel some 40, maybe 50 years after the events of Jesus' life. But he assures his readers that Jesus' life story is not over. 
He assures us that Jesus continues to be with his disciples, with his followers as the head of the church, that we are Jesus' resurrected body on earth. We are the ones who are living with his spirit. We are the ones who are speaking his word. We are doing our best to do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. We are the followers of the resurrected Christ. And we believe that everyone, anyone, whoever you are, you have the potential and call to be part of Jesus' movement. It isn't over. Now, I would like to end my sermon right there with the clarity of the Jesus gospel ringing in our ears. And I'm sure there are a number of you who say, yes, this will be a good time to stop. You made your point, Reverend Lance. But there's a lingering problem I feel I must address. It's the fact that not everybody back then, not in Jesus' day, not in Matthew's day, and not everybody even now, believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he continues his ministry beyond his death. Especially among the Jews in Matthew's audience, and I'm afraid some people even in Christian America, the very idea of resurrection seems impossible. It's incredible. Dead is dead, right? To say anything different is silly. If it isn't downright crazy. I mean, yeah, it's easy for me to say that Jesus' life story is not over because I live it. It's easy for me to say that Jesus continues to be with his followers as the head of the church to this very day because I work for that church. It's my career. It's easy for me to say we are Jesus' resurrected body on earth, that we live with his spirit, that we speak his word, that we do our best to do God's will on earth as it is in heaven, and we do it right here in Alpena, that we, first church, are followers of the resurrected Christ. Yes, we are. I say that because I believe it. But I can't say that for anybody else. I mean, how can I prove to anybody's satisfaction that the Easter miracle really happened if they choose not to believe it? One would think the very existence of the church in Jesus' name some 40 years after his crucifixion should have been evidence that something powerfully real had happened on that first Easter. Something happened to reverse the normal course of grief and fear. That normal process of anger and denial and resentment over the unjust death of Jesus, their leader. Something had given those disciples the boldness to go on. And to my way of thinking, what better proof do we have of the resurrection than those continuing services and sermons from those early disciples whose whole worldview had changed by their encounter with Jesus after his death. The transformation of the disciples themselves from fearful, depressed men and women who saw Jesus die on the cross. They saw his body being carried off to a tomb by a Pharisee. They saw the Roman guards seal shut the stone slab. They wept in grief for three days. To see these people, to see their fear change to faith, to see their cowardice change to courage, to see their doubts go to bold assurance that Jesus was alive, never to die again. To me, that's your proof. And if that's not sufficient evidence that something powerful happened at Easter, how do you explain the emergence of the early church? How do we explain the gathering of 120 of Jesus' followers in the upper room praying 50 days after Easter on Pentecost? Why were they still together if Jesus had not somehow reassured them he's still alive then and again and that he would be with them forever? How do you explain the boldness of Peter preaching to the very face of the very same authorities who had arranged for Jesus' execution? To me, those experiences are proofs that Jesus Christ had come alive, and he's still alive here at First Congregational UCC in Alpena, in you and in me. And oh, yes, there is that matter of the empty grave. In Matthew's telling of the Easter event, we found that peculiar little part of the story that Dottie read for us, where the chief priests and the elders devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you must say his disciples came by night and stole Jesus away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him, we'll keep you out of trouble. And so the guards took the money and they did as they were directed. And this story is still told to this day. Unquote. 
Well, Matthew wrote his version of the Jesus story some 40 years after the event, and yet he tells of this rumor that Jesus' disciples stole the body and the church made up the claim of Jesus' resurrection. But why would the disciples do such a thing? I mean, by the time the disciples heard this rumor being spread by the graveyard guards that they had stolen the body of Jesus, it probably made them laugh because by then they'd already met the risen Christ alive. I mean, think how amusing it must have been to hear this rumor about themselves being grave robbers. I mean, just think, how would, how would any of the disciples have had the nerve to preach about their continuing experience of the presence of the living Christ if they had in their possession secretly the dead body of Jesus over here? I mean, I mean, what wild hypocrisy would that be? The fact is we are still here 20 centuries later still preaching the good news of Jesus' gospel, alleluia, while the lie is just a footnote in Matthew's gospel. See, the promise and the power of Easter can be turned loose in your life just as it was in the lives of those early disciples. It can replace your fear with faith. It can replace cowardice with courage. It can replace the grieving memories we have of bitterness or betrayal with new boldness. That's the personal meaning of our faith. The resurrection is our ultimate reality. And I believe the life-giving, life-changing power of Jesus Christ can change our world even as it changed his world 20 centuries ago. That's the social meaning of our faith. It can affect the world for the good because we need a little resurrection every day. Against all the empty lies and the self-serving efforts of the world, all the collusion between powers, despite all the generations of festering fury and resentment, I believe that God's realm will be victorious because 